Welcome to Beyond Sport with Fiona Stewart. In this podcast, I chat to athletes, coaches, and industry professionals about their sporting journey and the lessons they've learned along the way. Guests range from Olympians to the everyday lover of sport, but the message stays the same. There is so much more to sport than what meets the eye. Make sure you hit subscribe on Apple Podcasts or follow on Spotify so you don't miss the release of each new episode. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram at Beyond Sport with Fiona Stewart. I'd love to hear from you. Today's episode is with the lovely Gemma Houghton, AFLW player for the Fremantle Dockers. Gemma takes us through how her journey in sport started with running and then on to basketball before making her way to playing AFL. Gemma also talks about the strong sense of community that sport provides and helps you through the good and bad times on and off the field. She also gives us an insight into how the universe always has a plan. I love that Gemma is out there inspiring kids across the country to get out there and give sport a go. For anyone tuning into the show for the first time, make sure you check us out on Instagram at Beyond Sport with Fiona Stewart for special behind the scenes content. I love connecting with listeners and seeing where you are listening from. So take a screenshot and tag me in your Instagram stories. That's enough from me. Let's hear from Gemma. So Gemma, can you tell us about your sport and how you got into it? Yeah, so very different sort of pathway into women's footy. So growing up, I was always around footy. We watched footy. It didn't matter who was playing. It was just, that was something that we just did. And my brother um, also played footy when he was younger. So we were attending his games. But I sort of started off more of like in the school sort of sports carnival. So I was a runner and that's what I wanted to be when I was younger. And as I got to an age of understanding role models around me, person who took a huge influence in my life was Kathy Freeman. So yeah, so I wanted to to grow up and be like her at a very young age. I think the earliest memory I can remember running in races would have been maybe year one. Wow. Um, down in Bunbury. So I went to Grace Christian Primary School, born in Bustleton, went to Grace Christian. And then I sort of had a mixture of, you know, just I loved I loved that running feeling that mm-hmm. I got in the races at school and then sort of took on a basketball um, journey where we played down in Eton my mum was actually the coach of the team in one season but um, back then we obviously being Bunbury was a bit smaller back then wasn't as big as it is now and we played on the outdoor concrete courts so I I forever had knee grazes and elbow grazes because I was just falling all over the floor and I guess I think that's where I found my love for sport was Uh at a very young age from then onwards went in well how old was I would have been eight years old I think year four so my parents um divorced and then we moved from Bunbury to Perth and I guess that's where um it was a whole new journey for me uh, being at at a young age moving up to a new a new sort of into a city Uh um and then going to primary school so primary school for me was Huntingdale Primary School which is for um it's it's a local suburb in Perth south of the river and um and my I guess that's where sort of my running, my running took off in the, in the sports carnivals. So um, I, I loved athletics, anything, anything physical. But even growing up, my probably my brother actually was my biggest influence in terms of growing me into the athlete that I am today. It was always a competition at home, <laughs> you know, <laughs> with just being around him. And then I guess having two other sisters growing up with, it was sort of, you know, you fight for the front seat and, yeah. and whatnot. So <laughs> I knew very quickly that I just always had that competitive nature. I probably stuck to to running, and that was probably from year four to, to year seven. It was it was I wanna I wanna go to the Olympics. I wanna be a runner like Kathy Freeman. Yeah. And I just I had this dream, and and anyone who would ask me what I want to do, that's what I would say. And and you sort of think back and think, well, it's. I think that as a child, you have no no limits in your mind of what you want to be. Mm-hmm. You just think, I want to be it, and, and no one tells you different at that age, so so you stick with it. And so that was what I wanted to do, was to be a runner. So then fast forward to, I guess, I was actually coached by John Gilmore, who is, he's he's passed away now. It was at Melville Little Athletics, and he was an ex-Olympic runner. Oh, wow. And he, 
Yeah, he had said to me in, in a couple of our training sessions that, you know, if I really wanted to, I could go. He, yeah. he had trained me and said, if you really want to go to the Olympics, you could. So that gave me more hope. But then I think I probably lacked, and I'll be honest, I probably lacked discipline at that age. And it was an individual sport. So I was, you know, rocking up and, and doing the training there by myself. And you're sort of competing against other people individually. But I was very fortunate. I had a stepdad, Alan, who would always run with me. I remember year six and year seven, we would just go for 3K runs around the river and and he was always helping with my running. So that's where I had it. But then I guess as I got older, you know, around the sort of 15, 16 year old mark, you, you lose interest pretty quickly. If it is an individual sport, I admire those that continue the sport because I think it takes a lot of discipline to get up and train by yourself. And then, yeah, so fast forward, actually an interesting story is I was 16 years old and I I um, actually got accepted into a traineeship at Woodside, which is a massive oil and gas company in, in Perth. Um, and at the time, obviously they have been for a number of years, they were and still are major sponsors of Fremantle Dockers. And so I was the youngest in the building working at Woodside. And that year, my brother turned 18, Joel, and he got drafted to Fremantle Dockers. Mm-hmm. It was the same year as Nat Fife and and all the other ones. So I just remember, you know, I was like, oh, my God, Nat Fife. And, like, <laughs> you know, like you didn't, you didn't know that they were going to turn into, you know, the big stars, stars. but I think it was just... It was just that, you know, we had the camera crew come around and I probably shouldn't say it, but my brother had a room full of West Coast stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the camera crew weren't allowed in there. But I just remember that being a special day. And I remember saying to mum, and I mean, I was still at a young age at 16, but I remember saying to mum, you know, I believe this is, I'm on the right path because mm-hmm. I was 16 working for Woodside and my brother got drafted to free and then major sponsors. So I was like, you know, it's sort of, the universe part of was working yeah. yeah yeah so it was weird and then Joel got drafted he was on the list for two years unfortunately he had a, a few injury issues so he got delisted but again with him being on the list I took even uh, more of an interest in footy but mm-hmm. I sort of stopped playing sports I guess from that six well I went to wobble for a bit but I didn't really enjoy it and then from 16 sort of to 18 I was happily in a relationship (laughs) so I again I lost interest but I I went into the SBL which is the state basketball league over here and I played for East Perth Eagles and I sort of got my passion back for for sport again and and just being you know that team environment and just that you know that that nature that sport actually brings yeah, I just started to train more and take more of an interest in like what I wanted to do and then it changed so went from wanting to be a runner to I want to play basketball for Australia (laughs) so that that was my next sort of dream like I'd love to you know be um be you know play in the in the women's NBL for Perth Lynx Mm -hmm. and that that was sort of another another goal that sort of popped up in my head I would love to do and achieve and then eventually represent um Australia in the Olympics which um was just always on my head like Olympics Olympics you know so played basketball for East Perth for a while I was playing in D-League which is the reserves for SBL I probably spent a bit more time I was quite young as well so Mm -hmm. I'm thinking back on that on the age gaps I would have been about 21 sort of 22 that I was playing in the SBL for East Perth I guess yeah I I sort of found that love again for basketball I was playing D-League I was had to really train outside of Mm -hmm. um I guess go away and, and work on yourself which I think people all all athletes as much as we have team um, aspirations and goals you you have individual and I think that oh that's every every human has individual you know goals and and desires and so I went away and trained and I did a basketball program an eight-week basketball program and that involved going into the gym because I hadn't really done a lot of gym work I didn't really like it to be (laughs) honest I liked I liked to just show up and play basketball on the court but yeah did a eight-week sort of program and and that helped massively with my basketball journey. So I was playing D-League and I was in a position where I was probably averaging 30 plus points a game in the D-League. And then that year, that's probably where I took, I guess, my own ability to another level. And the end of the season was rewarded with, I took out the first and best, or they call it the MVP for East Perth Eagles in the D-League. 
and then took out um, MVP for the D League overall. Wow! Over the whole, whole How comp. Cool yeah. That? Yeah. So so that was an achievement. And then with SBL, I sort of started gaining more minutes. I got about 15 more minutes. I was training with, I was very lucky to cross paths with Sammy Whitcomb, who plays at the Perth Lynx, but then went on to the women's NBA. And we did a couple of training sessions together. We just went down to the local bend at, which was Perry Lakes, and just were shooting hoops and did a training session, which I absolutely loved. And then to watch her journey go on and, and her play for the Perth Lynx and then go on to represent in the women's NBA. I was like, wow, like that's so cool. And that gave me more hope to keep, you know, trying with my dreams. I guess where the tables turned, I sort of, I was probably at my fittest in a sense for on the basketball court. It's a different, I've learned very quickly that basketball court fitness and football. It's very different. Aussie, <laughs> yeah, it's very different. So um, we finished our season with, with basketball and I sort of, you know, I was, I was averaging about 15 minutes um, in the SBL, but I sort of felt a little bit lost and maybe I lost a little bit of passion for basketball. And I'm not saying that that was basketball itself. It could have just been, been the, the timing or, or a different, you know, a different challenge coming my way. So then Ebony Antonio, who's one of my best friends, she inboxed my brother because they went to the same high school and just said, would Gemma ever be interested in playing footy? Obviously, my brother told me about it and I was always aware that there was because I actually played basketball at East Perth Eagles with Ashley Sharp who is obviously on our list and I'd spoken to her a few times about you know she was she was playing um, for Swan Districts and I probably I never knew the pathway to women's footy I, I didn't really play like I played it in school and, and stuff like that and I, I went down to watch my brother play at Huntingdale Junior Football Club when he was younger and, and I played a couple of games there but I was the only girl in the team and mm-hmm. the boys wouldn't tackle me <laughs> so you know I didn't I didn't really, you know but there was always that that love for footy I just didn't know where to start or I didn't know you could start sort of thing yeah and then I sort of you know fast forward Ebony sort of just yeah that's where the conversation started would I be interested in playing footy and I sort of asked myself a question like w- would I actually be interested in playing footy yeah and I thought yeah like why not you know I love footy and I grew up in the neighborhood playing with my brother against the neighborhood kids and it was fun I remember one day it was pouring down with rain and we'd put shoes as goals <laughs> and it was so muddy and we were just it was 2v2 v it was my brother and me versus two kids neighborhood friends and I remember just being covered head to toe in mud <laughs> and just playing footy <laughs> so I always had footy around me I just mm-hmm. you know didn't really play and then I, I just decided to take on that challenge. And so I went down to the talent search, which I knew a few people down there. So obviously Gabby O'Sullivan was down there. There was a few other people that I'd met, I guess, in the basketball journey that were down there as well. And I remember coming in and there were just so many girls just trying out. And there was obviously all these officials testing. And I was like, wow, it's actually like the real sort of <laughs> talent search. There was the beep test, the vertical jump, the 20 meter sprint and then there was like footy stuff I was very fortunate at that right timing that I was coming off a really good season with basketball and on court so the on court stuff in terms of the testing I sort of did well in my footy skills I could hand pass let's just say I couldn't kick (laughs) (laughs) I couldn't kick um I mean I could kick the the long high loopy ones Mm -hmm. but yeah it was it was it was all new to me so um I just remember when um, I did the testing and and then we were just sort of told it's interesting because the person that I was in contact with which was six years ago was Wilde well sorry Wade Spilker and he's still at the club today so he's been a part of the whole journey from from day one so I remember him calling me I was watching the draft I went to my auntie's house to watch the draft with my mum and all the family Mm -hmm. it's so weird I just remember them reading out all these names and um of all these you know amazing people that you see today playing still playing the game and I had no idea who they were and and I just remember feeling like you know what they went through the whole draft and my name didn't get called out and 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 it was at, at that moment that I thought do you know what like I actually have loved this journey of of footy and and trying out and everything like that so I said um to my family that from that day on I was you know I didn't I thought I didn't get drafted. Mm-hmm. Um, so I said, I'm, I'm going to go down and, and play at a local club because I've really enjoyed 
Foodie. And then it would have been probably 10 minutes had passed and I received a phone call from Michelle Cowan. And she said, you know, obviously you didn't didn't come through a, a junior football club or a waffle club. So I think it was something about we couldn't draft you that way, but we've picked you up as a free agent. Oh, um, awesome. Which is obviously, yeah, someone who hasn't come from that football, obviously being a basketballer. And she said, you're on the list. And I was like, <laughs> oh, my God, like, you know, I'm, I'm going to be a part of the inaugural AFLW season with Fremantle like Mm. it it was like wow like it was it's hard to explain because it's just I I look back and I just think everything sort of like like you mentioned before the universe had had always planned certain things and you look back and you go oh like it makes sense and it's crazy so so yeah obviously with with little knowledge but I remember playing my first game at TIO Stadium and it was the first time I'd actually been to Darwin and Darwin is very (laughs) humid and it's very hot and I just remember thinking what am I in for (laughs) you know I'm I'm going to be playing in the ruck and I'll never forget that game obviously I didn't really know but no one really mentioned about wearing a shin pad in the ruck (laughs) um so I went up in the ruck and I got sort of um I don't I can't remember I don't know who it was but obviously Adelaide Crows and um I just remember their boots coming into my shin and like jumping off it and I looked down and there was like a golf ball size lump on my shin and I was like I thought it was a bone that popped out but it wasn't but then I remember running off the field and getting it taped up and running back out and and then I think yeah after after that first game I think I was more you know in in impressed with counting how many bruises I ended up having on my body (laughs) because it's so different to basketball yeah but I had I had bruises everywhere I had bruises under my chin and I think you know and that that's sort of where the journey began and then I just thought wow like I love this game and there's so much like you know from from year one to now it's just that journey in itself outside of what I've already gone through in mm-hmm. life has been massive you know there's I, I look at my first year where I was just understanding the game and just chasing a ball really I yes. just full of energy just trying to chase the ball and understand the game and and being surrounded by amazing um leaders and and people that uh, are still some have left the club but but um you know it's very special that those that sort of led that way are still at the club fast forward to season two that's probably where I had the hardest part of my journey if if that makes sense but and that was in 2018 wasn't it yeah it was 2018 Mm -hmm. was the first year and then I finished that season. No, sorry. So 2017 was the first year. And yeah, and played. you played all seven games in that first yeah. year. Yeah. Yeah. So played all, all seven games. It was a bit of a weird feeling because obviously I think that season we didn't win any games or yeah, I think maybe one game. But mm-hmm. so that, that was sort of, you know, and for me, I was, you know, I knew, I, you know, I got very closely with um, one of my favorite players and she always will be is um, a catch who plays for Richmond but she was a part of you know the, the Frio stuff and you know Kirby Bentley was the vice captain and then obviously Cara Antonio was was the captain so I learned so much from from those girls and even Ebony and just about the game and at that stage you know I, I had met Kiara Bowers or Turbo but she obviously the first two seasons was injured and wasn't playing so I think you know you're sort of just trying to work out who's who and and build relationships and and you know and I think too it was a bit of a weird sort of you know there's a bunch of girls that don't really know know each other some do but Mm -hmm. you know you're 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 playing a whole new season in such a short amount of a pre-season time but yeah and then fast forward so when the 2017 season finished I went on to play in the waffle so I obviously my local club was Swan Districts Mm -hmm. so I went down to Swans and it would have been maybe in the fourth or fifth game in the waffle I remember getting tackled by two girls and I just remember getting kicked in the back of the leg and it was just this excruciating pain and I didn't know what it was and I hobbled off the bench and I couldn't play the rest of the game I thought I'd been corked and that's you know, I went to go see the physio and, and see some other people and they said, yeah, it's it's a cork, sort of bruising, just let it settle. But I remember, uh, you know, even when the bed sheets would touch my leg, I would scream. I oh would go gosh. through. Like, I just, yeah. And so three weeks had passed. 
I sort of was trying to run and um, Alicia Jans, who a massive part and still today one of my best friends, she came from a netball background and came into footy. She didn't go through the draft, but she was a train on and then got added onto the list through a train on. So she came down at Swan Districts and I remember we were running together. and She goes, Gemma, you're limping. <laughs> and I said, I was like, no, I'm not. And I was just running and she goes, no, you're actually limping. And I said, oh, okay. So then I went back to the physio and said, look, I, it's not getting better. Mm. And when they would push on a, on a point, I would go through the roof. So we went and got some um, MRIs and scans and it came back that I had a five centimeter stress fracture. Oh no. So yeah. So I, I had actually that moment when I got kicked or whatever, it, it actually caused a, a stress, stress fracture. And at that point, that was probably, you know, uh, that was probably, and when I say biggest, I know girls suffer huge injuries. But, you know, with basketball, I think the worst thing I had was a corked finger and some sprained ankles. Yeah. So that was my first sort of major injury. But for me, I, I didn't understand any of that stuff. I was very raw. And I, you know, I probably still am, even though, you know, but I think it was, It was just very different to me. I was very young. I would have been 22 maybe or 23. And then I I was injured. I was in a moon boot for about eight weeks and I probably felt a bit stuck. I didn't know what to do. And Mm -hmm. looking back on it, I did what you shouldn't do. (laughs) And I sat down and I ate and I ate and I ate. (laughs) So, and I look back and and those are the lessons that build you. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I I now know, you know, don't do that again. If you get in a, in a moon boot, make sure you stay fit and, and do what you can. But yeah, that was probably a really hard time in my life. I very quickly had gained 10 kilos and then we sort of had a few setbacks where it went away and then it came back as a reaction. Uh-huh. And then I took that into the 2018 season. So, um, and that was still under Michelle Cowan and I had some you know, some pretty tough conversations with Michelle and with Wade and with the coaching staff. And at our exit meeting, I only ended up playing two games that season for the club. One of them was absolutely amazing. I got to play at Optus Stadium against Collingwood. And that was when there was like 41,000 people there. Wow. Um, yeah, I remember, you know, obviously coming back from injury, I probably, looking back on it, I, I wasn't sort of in the best not just the mind frame but phys- physical side as well so yeah. you know I probably look back and could have definitely helped my team a bit more but I think we we ended up winning that game so that was still I think yeah um that was still uh, a massive achievement and just in women's sport I think that was when I realized like wow like women's sport is is huge with the amount of people that came down to watch so and then after that season I had a a really hard conversation with Michelle Cowan and with the coaching staff so basically you know the words sort of were you're not fit and I knew I wasn't fit Mm -hmm. and I'd gained the weight and and all of that and yeah I wasn't offered a contract for 19 season so I went away from the club and I actually had to really stop and think to myself what do I want you know like do I actually want to continue playing footy and my answer was yes and so I knew what I had to do I had to go away and work Um, my absolute butt off to get there and I was very fortunate that we had a neighbor down the road who was a a personal trainer and trained quite you know boxing and sort of that grappling raw sort of stuff so I just trained with him Mm -hmm. and I was training I remember I was training nearly every basically day I was playing in the waffle I was coming back to playing in the waffle in about 10 weeks after that meeting, I lost basically 10 kilos. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, so a kilo a week. But I was just, I remember just training, 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 training. And obviously not to a point where you injure yourself. Mm-hmm. But I just, I knew what I wanted. I wanted to get back on that list and I knew what I had to do. And, and the club weren't, you know, unfortunately, I realized then as well, like at the end of the day, no one's going to come and hold your hand. You have to do it. You have to do um, the work. If you, if you have to do the work and you can have that support, but you're the one that has to make that decision. So I went back and played in the waffle and I think it was round four in the waffle. So I was told that I had to go back at the end of the season and re-enter the draft. But during that time, there were some coaches change over. Michelle Cowan had left and Wade sort of was the manager at the time and they were looking for a new coach. And I think within round four of the waffle, 
um, for Swan Districts, Wade was watching some of the games and he had called me and said, you don't have to re-enter the draft where we're picking you back up. Oh, um, awesome. What a relief. Like, <laughs> yeah. And, and he just said, look, like, to be honest, we probably didn't expect you to go away that quick and, and come back. And so, you know, a lot of hard work, a lot of discipline, um, eating the right things and, and just having a strong mindset, just just believing in myself. I was lucky too. Like I was good friends with a, my club sponsor at the time, Desmond, who is now my manager, <laughs> um, my playing manager. So again, the world's, you know, meet again. But I remember just sitting down and writing down some goals with him. And I really feel like that helped my journey. I feel like you, you need to write down goals mm-hmm. so that you have something to work with. It gives yourself hope and gives yourself a purpose, I guess, of, of what you're doing. So fast forward, I finished that waffle and then after that year in the waffle, I took out fairest and best for the Swan Districts, Mm -hmm. my first ever football award. And then out of the whole waffle, W came runner up by one point against Hayley Miller. And that's when I thought, wow, like, you know, this is, this is what I really, uh, you know, I I don't want to get back to that. And then I had a bit more confidence, I guess, in the game and in my, my fitness. So I was able to take that into to the 2019 season and that's when I sort of was playing a bit of a ruck role in the first second year but then when Trent Cooper came on board that was his first year as a coach and I remember just our conversations just looking up to him and going like you know wow like with his with his footy journey as well and I guess the relationship that we formed as a player and uh, as a coach just gave me belief in myself as well again mm-hmm. from all that injury and, and the, the setbacks to I guess coming back and so I played a different role where I sort of chopped in the ruck, but I was more forward and I definitely enjoy forward. I've, <laughs> I've played back and I've played ruck and I do love forward, the forward position, but again, I'll play wherever <laughs> You're the, just team, happy the team to play. needs me. <laughs> yeah, happy to play. And in 20, but, um, 2019, yeah. sorry, like, but you, you played all eight games and you were actually the club's leading goal kicker for that year. So for someone who, you know, started the AFL journey and they couldn't kick, how did like how amazing is it that a few years later you were the leading goal kicker? Yeah, I know. So it was it was crazy. So yeah, 2019 was named for in the first All Australian team as a, as a full forward. Mm-hmm. So that was a massive achievement. And then in the fairest and best for Fremantle, I came third. And I thought, wow, like I've gone from last season to being 10 kilos heavier and mm-hmm. not offered a contract, to standing on a stage in third place. And it was so weird. I remember again thinking. It's meant to be because the people that gave out the third award were Woodside. Oh, and I was wow. like, I was like, I said to the lady, I was like, it's so weird that, you know, it's presented by Woodside. I said, I worked at Woodside when I was 16. <laughs> so um, it was weird. I had a year off um, waffle. Mm-hmm. I finished the season with some stress sort, sort of issues. So I had eight weeks off. And then into the 2020 season, I guess we had a very successful year in 2019. And that was when we made finals, the prelim final against Carlton. Mm -hmm. Um, We ended up losing that though, but I guess um, just the whole team. And that was the first year that Turbo played. I'm in awe of (laughs) of Turbo and she's just her journey and her, like looking at her and the injuries she's overcome and the journey that she's overcome to to seeing that on the field. And that's where, you know, I understood and, and learned very quickly those girls that are leaders in the club today and, and you just, think well you hear their story and it inspires you and then you go and do your story and then you inspire others and and that's what it's about really it's everyone has sort of setbacks and up and downs but it was crazy yeah so then 2020 that was when we had our best year as a club um seven games undefeated and then COVID came (laughs) and it shut down the season didn't it you guys had to fully shut down yep so we played in the final against Gold Coast and that was it Fremantle Oval no crowd was allowed Mm -hmm. however our our purple army turned up and were (laughs) outside the gate we could hear him cheering and that was a huge game for us because it sort of went towards the end of the season Juddy was saying you know and it was true it was we played against Western Bulldogs with no crowd and Mm -hmm. and you know we sort of went to the back end of the season that this could be your last game this could Mm -hmm. be your last game and so we went into the final against Gold Coast and we all had that mindset this could be our last game so we gave it absolutely everything and we ended up winning by I think 70 points Wow! Um, yeah and then the next day 
I remember being at the beach with my best friend and we were recovering and I looked on Instagram and I'd seen that the season had been cancelled and I was like oh no <laughs> like you know so I think that was again it it sort of you feel a bit flat you know mm-hmm. seven games undefeated and you know the club were absolutely amazing and and Coops obviously spoke to us and said he you know obviously he he won't be in the history books but um he'll forever be proud of us and the club will be proud of us so so that was really um special and and then fast forward to the season just gone again we played finals but it was weird because we were into round three and we had just beaten Adelaide away and that was a huge achievement for us because we were ticking things that we had never done before and then we ended up losing against Brisbane Lions who took out the premiership in round four we're hungry now we're back in (laughs) pre-season so Fingers crossed that COVID doesn't come again. <laughs> yes, yeah, that it, that, or even that there's precautions in place to allow you guys to play. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you've been through such an, you know, like you said before, like an up and down journey and you've been through having that goal of playing or participating in sport at the highest level for like three sports. Has there been like a benefit from any of them that sport has provided you that's like transferred over to everyday Gemma? Yeah, I think, like I said, I, I grew up wanting to be like Kathy Freeman and she had such a huge impact on my life and I didn't even know it. And she probably <laughs> doesn't even know I exist. Although I did do a city to surf run with her and when she came to Perth and I was probably an hour behind her, but I got a photo <laughs> with her. <laughs> so, um, and she signed it. So that was pretty cool. But yeah, I think now it's it's interesting because obviously being a part of the inaugural season and and it was, I remember it was very weird um, at the start. And I can tell you now I've had conversations with some of the new draftees and they say the same thing is they don't have a signature. They, mm-hmm. you know, they, they they get a bit weird when people ask for photos and stuff. And I think that was probably my biggest thing. I jumped from SBL into footy and it's it's a whole nother world. Mm-hmm. Um, the fans, the supporters, the club, the professionalism, you know, I think that's probably where I learned my most would would be at the club mm-hmm. and not just not not even just in what it takes to be a professional athlete but also culture and identity as well so so the last six years I feel like I've really grown and Fremantle have have shaped and not just Fremantle but I guess AFL yeah. and AFLW have helped shape I guess the person I I am and becoming into and I think I've just realized that no matter what level of sport you play there is such a community there is such a, a family involvement and I've spoken to and obviously being a cross coder and there are a number of cross coders jumping from sport to sport mm-hmm. but you know I, I think it's amazing that other sports accept other sports as yeah. as athletes you know it, it doesn't matter if you grow up a, a runner or a basketballer like there's no right or wrong way into your journey mm-hmm. of sport and I think anyone can agree that sport is definitely an accepting place yeah yeah and and it doesn't matter what religion you believe in what race you are you know what gen any of that stuff it it it's all sport is just a place where we all come together and we all love you know we all get to just be a part of that and watch other people be a part of that I feel exactly the same way and I'm so happy that you said that because like I came from an individual sport of swimming and I feel the exact same like I'm feel like talking to you know yourself and some of the other guests on we have maybe not no sports in common no you know geographical background in common like I'm in Victoria and you're in Perth but like having a love and passion for sport and we're able to connect and we're able to you know achieve something together and have a genuine conversation like things like that helps you like you said it shape your identity and grow as a person yeah it does and I think that sport is also like it's like a not a distraction but it's a thing that we all love and come together mm-hmm. but outside of that I mean we're, we're in a position at the moment where all AFLW players you know are having to still work full time mm-hmm. and do training and on top of their family things and I think you realize very quickly that and I have too, like I lost a close friend and I have, I've shared it on social media, but I lost my best friend to suicide 10, 10 weeks or 11 weeks ago today. Oh, I'm so um, sorry, Gemma. I'm so yeah, sorry for your no, loss. That, that's okay. Yeah. But it's crazy because for four weeks after it had happened, I was very, very lost and, mm-hmm. I, and I was so, 
you know, I've probably took a, a downhill plummet again and it was just another another hurdle to overcome. And I look back and I think, you know, yeah, 11 weeks is is not a long time to lose someone and go through that. But where I am now is so different to where I was 11 weeks ago. And that is a massive help to my family, my friends around me, but the club as well. Um, yeah. You know, going back to that family and support, the club, the AFLPA, you know, just having our SNC coach, Kate Starr, who is incredible. She, we're very lucky to have her at our club. She's an ex Olympian for Hockey Roos and she led them, or she's won a gold medal in the Olympics. Wow. And she's, she's actually coached them to, to the Olympics as well. And I remember one, one training session, she actually casually pulled out the gold medals that she won at the <laughs> Olympics. And I remember holding it, just thinking, wow like it's so amazing just to have someone like her and she's been absolutely incredible with obviously helping me get back on my feet not just mentally but physically and yeah. and, and building back into it and the club have been supportive too so again it goes back to everyone has their own journey in life and and outside of sport have things going on but when you face those things that sort of shake your world up Mm-hmm. you've got a whole community behind you you've got a whole club behind you whatever sport you're in and I think that's why everyone loves well not everyone well, but I think that's why sport is such a huge part of society yeah yeah because I definitely it, agree yeah. and it should and I think yeah. it should stay a huge part of society <laughs> yes no it is I, I mean I, I know I've spoken to a lot of people as well that have just watched the men's season and and they've said you know being in lockdown sport has been what they've looked forward to so yeah, it, it does. It, it plays a huge role and an impact. And I think even individually, I guess, you know, with us girls now, I guess being like, it's crazy. We finish a game and, you know, you just see these young girl or just young, young kids, young boys, young girls supporting you and watching you play footy and, and even young girls wanting to grow up and, and, and be, now be, <laughs> be, be like you. And it's like, what, like, you know, it, it, it's crazy to think that it is like that, but it's such a it's such an honour to to be able to you know give back to the community and and inspire and give hope to any other kids who are wanting to play. And it's funny because the one thing I say I often hear young girls say, "Well, I've never played footy," and I go, "Well, I didn't either." You yeah, know? it's about if you want if you want to do it you know it may be challenging but if you want to do it you really you really can do it yeah and in saying Mm. that like one of the questions I ask is there's has there been like a project or something that you've been involved in that's used sport to develop the community other than being your amazing inspirational self by getting out there and doing it has there been like a project that you've done yeah, well, I work, we still work outside of the football season. So I'm very lucky to um, work at the Institute of Indigenous Wellbeing and Sport. That's um, amazing. Yeah. So Barry Winmar is the CEO and he is very understanding and very supportive in terms of me, you know, working, but also giving me that flexibility. Okay, I've got to go to training now, I've got to leave a bit earlier and all this other mm-hmm. stuff. So that that helps hugely. And I know there's a number of girls across you know, the footy world that get that support from their workplace. But I'm very lucky I get to go out into to schools and work with young kids, um, young Indigenous girls and boys and, and just any young sort of athletes. I'm in that world where I can go and teach sport and, and teach cultural identity, sort of like help along along that journey. But I just, I don't know, give give back. And it's weird. I have 10-year-olds coming up to me saying, I want to play footy for the Dockers. <laughs> I'm like, oh, well, like you can, you yeah. know can there's now that pathway so yeah uh, it's outside of Frio but it's working in the community going to a number of schools for me it's like I understand that not not every person I meet is going to have that same dream or aspire like aspire to be a sports person Mm -hmm. so I'm not going to be like you know what team do you want to play for because I everyone's different so but for me it's it's more so connecting I guess with with people in a way and and the young kids that you know like whatever you want to do you can achieve yeah and and your dreams you know the one thing I've learned is like the only limits that are out there are the ones that we put on ourselves and we sort of hold back because we just think oh life's meant to be this way Mm -hmm. and we're not meant to dream big but it's like no you are like can be hard sometimes stepping out into that like I I had no idea what I was getting myself into stepping into the footy field but Mm -hmm. I love it and I wouldn't change it and you know, I think it's it's not always connecting, I guess, on, on a sport level with everyone, but just on a 
you know, that we all face our own sort of struggles and that you you can use that to build you mm-hmm. and, and then go on to talk to other people and, and you'll inspire them and help yeah. them with their journey. I think that's yeah. a, such an important lesson and it's one that sport has taught you. But like you said, like you could learn that if you um, like play the guitar or if you yeah. do something else like mathematical or, or you're studying something like it doesn't just have to be sport. It's just sport was the vehicle that taught you that lesson. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's true. It's true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I'm so not, I don't, I don't think I have a vehicle of, of maths and art, arts <laughs> and stuff. That's not my vehicle. <laughs> I'm not good at driving those. No, that's fine. Sport, sports getting you yeah. where you need to go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so my last question is where do you see the future of sport? And you can answer that in the context of particularly AFL or AFLW, uh, or you can answer that in the context of like, sport in general because you are inspiring kids not just for the sport of football but like for other sports yeah. as well yeah well I think obviously yeah, I mean I'm at an age now where I understand things I, I see the news and I, and I see what's happening around the world and and in particular with with women and, and women's sport mm-hmm. um it's it's just grown massively and I think it will continue to grow I think you know, there's there's pathways. When I was younger, I said I wanted to grow up and be like Kathy Freeman. But now I feel like if there's young girls that sort of say, oh, well, I want to grow up and, and be like a, an AFLW star yeah. or, you know, a, a cricket star or a netball star or a basketball star or, or an Olympian or whatever it is, it's there's, I feel like there's such a huge rally behind that now. And there is, there's not that, you know, oh, okay, we'll do this and do that. It's like, it's like, well, you've got a whole uh-huh. community, a whole generation behind you and wanting to achieve that. And I think that's amazing because, you know, I think it's probably a lot different to when I was younger. Yeah. And it, it's just, it's a whole new world for, for young athletes who want to take that journey of, of sport and, and see where it can take them. Yeah. And I love that. And I feel the exact same way. Like I grew up and I didn't know like women's football was a thing because it wasn't yeah. around. Whereas like nowadays little girls who are like eight years old are growing up and seeing it on the TV so that when they go oh I want to be a footy player they're not going to have you know mum and dad sitting there with a beer going what do you mean there's no footy players on TV because they are (laughs) yeah yeah they are on the TV yeah and I think I think that's why it's so weird for me understanding that because the same thing like you, you didn't grow up and see women playing footy on TV and now you do so when young girls sort of come up to you and you know look up to you and stuff you, you get a bit taken back by that and uh-huh. you, you sort of you're in awe of it because it's it's huge but at the same time you're like wow like you're watching the world of sport change so in quickly. front of you and, and you're a part of it yeah yeah, yeah. so oh, I love that it's, yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> well Gemma thank you so so much for you know being a change maker in the world of women's sport you know by inspiring yeah. people and by the even the paid work that you do like that's phenomenal and again like thank you for sharing your journey because I like I'm sure someone out there who's going maybe through hard times with injury or something like that or you know not feeling their passion for their sport will learn something from hearing this yeah no thank you for having me Fiona Thank you for listening to this episode of Beyond Sport with Fiona Stewart. This is a completely independent podcast that has been created to share the journey and lessons of top level sporting professionals, but also your everyday lover of sport. If you liked this podcast, I'd really appreciate if you could leave a review and share it with someone who you think would also enjoy it. Until next time.